Welcome back. As the world watches Ukraine, now under full-scale invasion by Russia, there's one boy who in many ways is the embodiment of that nation's trauma and resilience. His name is Mikola, a boy W5 has been following for more than six years. Molly Thomas has the story of an accidental victim of military conflict in a country where the prospect of war never seems to go away. In a country under siege, Ukrainian soldiers and everyday citizens are standing up to defend their country. The full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine has everyone on edge. It is very close, and that makes life a little bit scary. Scary, because Ala Nizhnikovska and her family live in Mariupol, Ukraine, just 50 kilometers from the Russian border, an early target of attack. They know all too well the destructive consequences of war, even on innocent children not directly involved in the fighting. Which makes this day all the more remarkable. The Dnipro River cuts right through the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv. From one shore to the next, it's a little less than half a kilometer wide. An easy distance for any strong swimmer. But the teenage boy making the crossing on this day isn't your typical fish in the water. His name is Mikola, he's Allah's son, and he's a triple amputee. I like swimming. I like achieving goals. I wanted to become a Paralympian. Mikola made it across in an impressive 14 minutes, much faster than any other amputee in Ukrainian history. An amazing accomplishment. one that would never have been possible without the help of Canadian doctors, nurses, and rehab specialists. Yes, I am proud of myself. I am a hero. Nothing is out of reach for a young man who has overcome so much already. W5 first met Mikola in October of 2015, when he was brought to this military hospital in Kyiv. Here, a Canadian medical team was on a week-long mission to treat wounded Ukrainian soldiers, in what was then an active military conflict. But when they heard about 11-year-old Mikola, they had to help. I remember taking care of him and meeting him and the uh, first time in the uh, examining chair. And uh, that was quite a sight to behold, actually. I guess a pure evidence of, the, of collateral damage of war uh, right there in front of you in a, in a little boy. Anesthesiologist Dr. Adrian Havaleshka was taking part in his second humanitarian mission to Ukraine, but he'd never seen a patient like Mikola before. I was obviously emotionally affected in, by his very presence. If you're not affected by a child that, that has been ravaged by war like this, then, then honestly, I question whether you have a soul. Two months earlier, in August 2015, Mikola, his mother Ala, and his little brother Daniel were living in Volodarske, a village in eastern Ukraine. Only about 50 kilometers from the front lines. Ala first opened up with W5 six years ago. The place where we lived, there was a training battleground. There was ammunition all over the place, and my son found a grenade near a pond. I found this grenade and took it to show my friends. We put it in the middle of the road, and then a friend of mine pushed me towards it. I stepped on it, and it exploded. My mother and I ran out to the street and saw pieces of flesh and skin and bones all around. Everything was covered with blood. I was praying to God he would survive. Mikola miraculously survived, but his four-year-old brother, Danyo, died instantly. The 11-year-old had no time to grieve as he was in and out of hospitals to save his own life. That's how he met the Canadian team stationed at a military hospital in Kyiv. I remember arriving at the hospital, operations, injections, the pain when the narcotics would wear off. A lot of negative things like that. 
At the time, Mikola was a frightened and broken little boy. The grenade had ravaged his entire body, leaving shrapnel throughout. Part of his skull was gone, as were most of his legs and his right arm. Mm. He said that there was shrapnel in his upper jaw. We don't see it. Yeah. The medical team in CAVE wasn't able to address Mikola's amputated limbs. That would come later. It's an old CT, we'll get a new one. But they could treat the wounds to his face and the hole in his skull. Take me back to 2015. You met the first Canadian doctors. What did you think? Yes, Canadian doctors really went out of their way to put us at ease. They'd made me feel welcome. Some of them would even joke around or try to make McCullough laugh to lower the stress. And it worked. When I turn on the machine, mm -hmm. it's going to start smelling like farts. It's not sure farts, it's <laughs> That's Dr. Havaleshka warming up Mikola for surgery. And every kid, universally, no matter what culture, they know what that is and they think it's funny. How did that make you feel, Mikola, hearing a joke? After laughing, it seemed like the operation was less risky and it was easier for me. Easier, but still scary, all the same. Any shrapnel? Do you want to do this one? Mikola's body was littered with shrapnel. This piece, about a centimeter and a half long, was in his chin. There would be more extensive surgeries to come, but this facial reconstruction work changed the way he looked at himself. The operation allowed him to regain some sense of self-confidence. He wasn't as ashamed or shy. Fewer people were pointing fingers at this scary-looking guy. Our group did what they could when they could do it. Um, and the fact that it came at a point in his life where things could get a lot worse or things could get a lot better, I think it was just fortuitous that we were there, we were in the right place at the right time, and we could do something about it. But that wouldn't be the only help Akola received from Canadians. Word of his plight spread, and the Canada-Ukraine Foundation arranged for him to get further treatment, this time in Canada. It's mid-December 2015, and McCullough is once again back in an operating room, this time at the Shriners Hospital in Montreal. Uh, was a little bit more than you were the doctors remove shrapnel and shorten what remains of his left leg to help it fit better into a prosthetic limb. The surgery marked the beginning of a year of world-class rehabilitation and treatment. All medical care paid for by the Shriners Hospital, with at least nine different specialists from various disciplines helping in McCullough's recovery, none more than Rochelle Rhine. Well, when we first met him, the day that he came to the Shriners, he was a little boy all curled up into himself. He didn't make eye contact with us. It was frightening, I think, for him. So but we could see right away the value of what we could do at Shriners for him. He's going to walk, not holding on to your mother. The pair would spend more than 100 grueling rehab sessions together. Very, very good. Progress was slow, and early on at least, Oops. Mikola was shaky on his new legs. But his resolve never wavered. How would you describe Mikola's spirit? I know you'd see tons of kids come in here. You know, like, is there something that stands out about him? I think his resilience, determination, um, always wanting to try his hardest. And he really wanted to walk. He said that he had a goal and he, he was determined to achieve it. He still is the only person I worked with with three amputations. Do you remember Rochelle, the physiotherapist in Montreal? Yes, of course, we remember Rochelle. She basically instilled her soul in Mikola. She became like family. He relearned the skills that he had before he lost his limbs. It was like he was born again. She helped me train, relearn everything from tying my shoelaces to walking to exercising on weight machines. I only have good memories of her.
And what was that like to be back uh, on your feet again, Mikola? I mean, I know it took a lot of work, but what was that like to be moving again on your own? It took a lot of work and a lot of effort, but I felt like I had my legs back. So those Canadian physiotherapists, they changed his life. Yes, 1,000%. They did the impossible. For the past five years, Ala Mikola and his little sister Zlata have been back in Ukraine. COVID lockdowns have meant a lot of time at home lately, allowing Mikola to explore a new passion, cooking. I love to make potato recipes for my family. I cook them in the oven and make potato pancakes. He's made pies, he's made pierogies. He really, really enjoys it. As for his first love, swimming, most of the pools have closed, so it's been difficult for Makola to get in the water. But today is a special treat. He's learning the basics of scuba diving while visiting a military base close to his home. In the water, there is more freedom. It's a lot easier. For those medical professionals who helped change his life for the better, it's gratifying to even get a glimpse into Mikola's current life. What it's like, like you know, seeing him at, at this stage of life after all these years. Well, I'm happy to see him participating in training. That's amazing. He's free in the water. The water is a medium in which he can he moved well. So I think swimming is a great um, activity for him to be competing in, and I bet he's I bet he's really good at it. By any stretch of the imagination, he, he has affected my life more than I have affected his. What an right from the beginning, what an incredible young man. Coming up. In Ukraine, it's very difficult to be a disabled person. The struggle to heal at home. It's clearly harder than it was for him when he was here. When W5 continues. For 17-year-old Mikola Nizhnikovsky, a day at the gym isn't just a way to get in a good workout. It's vital to his never-ending physical rehabilitation. Nowadays, the Ukrainian teenager trains twice a week, strengthening and stretching his body. It was torn apart when he was just a young boy, an innocent casualty of military conflict. Back in August of 2015, tensions were once again high between Ukraine and Russia. Ukrainian soldiers were training near his family's home. He and his little brother Danyo came across a grenade. It detonated, ravaging Mikola's body and killing four-year-old Danyo. More than six years have passed since Danyo's death, but he's still ever-present in their lives. His grave site is not far from where they now live. He is in our thoughts constantly. We go to the cemetery. We look after his grave. Do you talk about him with the other kids? It's very, very difficult for Mikola. He cannot bring himself to go to the grave. And when he starts thinking or remembering, he slips into depression. He starts blaming himself. Mikola, I know you told me that you, you, you try to put the accident behind you, but do you still think of your brother? Yes, I remember about my brother. Mostly bad memories. When our translator asked about nice memories, he acknowledged there were many, but started choking up. Yes, from childhood. An unimaginable weight on the shoulders of a young boy, now on the verge of becoming a man. The tragedy happened, but I need to move on. You don't need to dwell on it. Hold on. 
That's how McCullough has always faced his future. Even back in Montreal, where he spent 12 months being treated for his injuries and fitted for prosthetic legs. One, two, three, go. Thank you, thank you very much. Very, very welcome. Exactly. The year of treatment in Canada is night and day compared to what we have had since in Ukraine. In Ukraine, there are practically no rehabilitation centers like we had in Montreal. It's very difficult to find professional medical attention. And even harder to find McCola proper prosthetics. The Canadian prosthetics are too small. They were amazing. I could walk on them for a long time, but I grew quickly. Even after I outgrew them, I still kept walking around in them. For a long time, he lived without any prosthetics. They tried to make prosthetics in Ukraine, but the quality isn't the same. Last year, in August, he got new prosthetics, but they are different from the ones he had, and he is still getting used to them. How do you get around, Mikola? How do you be an almost adult and, and, and live your life? I have prosthetics and I have a wheelchair. And can you go places on your own? It's more difficult in the winter, but in the summer, yes, it takes time, and it's difficult, but I can get out. Obviously, uh, life still has many challenges, Allah. In Ukraine, it's very difficult to be a disabled person. Many disabled people just simply stay at home. They don't go out. They don't leave their homes. But that's not an option for McCola. He's determined to live life to the fullest, even though simply leaving the house can be exhausting. His most recent set of prosthetic limbs simply don't fit right. If I had prosthetics like the Canadian ones, then I'd walk around more and talk with more people. It's an effort for him to walk. He's leaning on his mother and using any, anything that his left hand can grab onto. So it's, it's clearly harder than it was for him when he was here. Canadian physiotherapist Rochelle Ryan spent a year teaching McCullough how to walk again back in 2016, but now believes he may be better off relying on his wheelchair. So. There's a lot of value to just using a wheelchair to get around because you get places, you're not as exhausted, and it's about participation, really, and independence. Obviously, you know, the prosthetic season is a challenge. Is it difficult to, to watch him, you know, struggle at the same time? I think that kids who are amputees, the double amputee, um, even a triple amputee, there's just so many challenges. So I'm not surprised that he's having a harder time walking now and that he spends more time in his wheelchair. I would expect that. Ala, do you believe that Mikola can get back to where he was when he left Canada? Yes, I believe. I have to believe. But ultimately, it depends on him. How he keeps in shape and looks after himself physically. His efforts and work will determine the level of his independence. But despite his time in the gym, pulling himself up a wheelchair ramp is still no easy task. It's very difficult for him to get around. Mikola's wheelchair is not electric, it's manual. And even with that, there are places you can't access with a wheelchair at all. Places like this butcher shop. They may not have a wheelchair ramp, but at least the staff here came out to help him. According to Mikola, that doesn't usually happen. In Ukraine, few people want to do something nice and beneficial for the disabled. Wheelchair ramps and access ways are also often in really bad shape. The lack of accessibility here makes them miss the country that kickstarted Mikola's healing. 
Almost every day I think of Canada. I would go back to Canada in a heartbeat. You're wearing a Montreal Canadiens shirt. What do you think of when, when, you, when you see that, when you see that shirt? I have a shirt, a hat, and lots of other clothing from Canada. All right, you're too good. There are very many warm memories connected to the clothing. And when I put them on, those memories come back. But while they dream of a return to Canada, for now at least, Ukraine will remain home. An incredible Makola has his eyes set on new goals. So what's next for you, Makola? What's your next big goal in life? In the spring, I will turn 18. New opportunities will open up. First, you need to find a job, earn money, and take care of your own needs. Get a car and all that. I'm going to continue my schooling and learn how to cook. I want to bake a beautiful cake. There are times when he is down, but then he picks himself up when he thinks about the future. Despite it all, he loves life. With the Russian invasion, Mikola's home city, Mariupol, is right now on the front lines. His mother texted W5 to say that things are very scary. <laughs> 